and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to The Future is Female. This is the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. I am so delighted to introduce my guest today, Dr. Kausalya Devi Satu, who is former Deputy Commissioner for the Malaysian Prisons Department. She recently retired and she's here uh, joining me on the show to talk a little bit about her journey uh, within the prison management system. Thank you so much for being Thank here with you, me Melissa. today. I am so curious to learn more about how you um, <laughs> joined the prison department. What inspired you to choose this career path and um, keep at it, rising all the way to become Deputy Commissioner of the Prisons Department? Okay, to begin with, prison uh, service was never in the list of my list of ambitions <laughs> or list of jobs that I'll be doing. Right. You know, I, 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 I think if you ask any of the prison officers, that will be the answer. That this isn't a job that they thought they would they have? They ever thought, yes. Oh, okay. But um, uh, uh, when I went into this job for the interview, uh, I was doing my master's at the time. And uh, this job, list of jobs, you know, you, you, you have to put in, when you apply in SPA, you have to put the list of jobs, I think it's about five at that time. So this, I just put it in, not knowing what the job was about. But I had a very um, a, a great passion on uniform service. Mm. Okay. So when, uh, when I went into this job, basically not knowing about what the job was all about, but after serving for 31 years, I think I had not even a little bit of regret why I joined the service. In fact, the person who interviewed, the officer who interviewed me, he, he, he sort of like thought that I would not last long in the job because I had my master's and uh, I don't know for what reason he thought. He said, I give you six months. You'll be here only for, the, for six months and mm. I think after that you will skip to another job. But <laughs> I, I wish stayed, he was. You stayed for thirty-one. Thirty-one years. years. Yeah. I wish he was still alive for me to for me to go and say that and I completed my thirty-one years in the service. Right. What What does the job entail? What does prison service entail? Okay, uh, we were actually when I went to the uh, to the prison, we were the first eight female, were were first taken by the prison department on uh, among the graduates. We were the first eight female. There were seven Malays, and I'm the only Indian, and. Uh, we were recruited into the service, uh, I think because at that time, prison was going beyond the traditional way of, uh, of working, where, where we talk about uh, implementing rehabilitation, and that needs a lot of, uh, a different level of thinking. Mm. So that's where I think they recruited the graduates at that time to, to see uh, or to bring the department to the next level. Right. So this was in the transition of a mindset towards uh, from kind of punitive exactly. uh, um, prison system to a more restorative Re rehabilitation, rehabilitation, then reintegration and restorative. Then, wonderful. Okay, yes. so so that you were there during this kind of transition, transition. This paradigm shift. Exactly. D so, what? So talk to me again about what what that entails in terms of the prison service. What what did you have to do with your work? Okay, uh, so when I went in as deputy superintendent, we were in the middle management uh, level of uh, the service. So. We were asked to conduct a lot of um, uh, managing the inmates according to the rules and regulations and we had a lot of benchmarking with uh, foreign, uh, our, our counterparts with uh, in the... Also international, international best we, practices. And uh, a lot of international uh, regimes and uh, were focused so that the group of us being graduates can implement such, it will be easier for us to implement knowing that um, probably uh, the way we think about the prison system should be different from the, what you say as the punitive to more of a rehabilitative kind of a center. Mm, wonderful. Okay, so when <clears throat> towards uh, you know when you reached kind of pinnacle of your career as deputy commissioner, when you looked around, were there more women <laughs> in leadership roles than when you first joined? Oh yes, definitely, okay. <laughs> definitely. Because uh, when we came in, we were the we were the top like the, leaders. The pioneer batch pioneer of that. Batch of that level, yes. uh, we are talking about the, the professional manage, group. Mm. The professional group. So, um, and later, after my batch, I think they started to take in more. I think we showed some good example for them to have that good thing about having female graduates to come into the service to, uh, to ensure that uh, the department serves a, gives a better service compared to a very punitive style of... Mm. Uh, what, why is it important that there are women in prison, uh, in leadership roles in the prison management system? 
Because um, besides heading the women prison, because uh, for it, it, it is stated in the rules that a uh, women prison and prisoners are to be managed by female officers. Mm. So uh, and I think when we uh, women came into the service, there was a lot of focus on women. How it is actually very different in uh, managing female inmates compared to male inmates. Oh. That is why I think the in uh, globally this Bangkok rules came up. Bangkok rules is rules specifically how to manage female prisoners right from admission to the treatment and to the reintegration. Oh. And why it's Bangkok rules because it is first um, uh, established in Bangkok by the royal from the Bangkok. So, so she is very much she has the passion for inmates in uh, in Thailand and uh, that rules actually being implemented globally right so so tell me about how those bangkok rules have made for um different experiences for female inmates versus say male inmates how what are the challenges that women face in malaysian prisons and how has bangkok rules changed that okay uh you see basically when you when you manage a prison you're talking about uh, uh admission and all that but for female the way you you it's not a welcoming into the prison, but the way you bring them into the prison itself is very important because women are very down emotionally, socially and psychologically because they feel very hopeless. You know, uh, it's not easy to, to be a women inmate actually because they feel very hopeless and especially if they are mothers themselves, they feel that they had not, they have the, 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 the guilt feeling that they had not been uh, taking care of, they're supposed to take care of their children and all that. Or even being there, being they they can also be the head of the family. Mm. So when all that is not being done by them, they are very down emotionally. So the way you handle them right from the admission itself is going to be totally different. Not to say to welcome them to the prison, but, but to feel approach, that yeah. uh, they are not. After all, they are not in a worse place. They for some reason they are there, but they are going to have a better life after leaving the the, the prison. Uh, institution itself. So not to lose hope. Hope. Essentially. Yes. Okay. Because uh, women basically are caregivers. So when they are not able to do that, they feel they are, they are not worth being the, that women that is supposed to be. Yeah. How does the incarceration of women affect fa their families, particularly their children? Okay. Um, as I said, they are basic caregivers. Mm. So um, y you can see the difference when, when a male comes to the prison. The, the children are always cared, taken care by the wife and they don't, I think they don't even think about how the children are because they know the wife can handle with all the multitasking a woman can do. <laughs> but it is unlikely for the women when she is in the prison, majority of the uh, children are given away. Given away means either the, the, the mother-in-law will take care of one of them if they have five children. The mother-in-law will take care of one, the sister will take care, the mother will take care. So they are all away from being in that unit, the family unit where the mother usually keeps them when the say if the husband is in the prisons. So with this, you can see the family unit is broken, right? And the love, it's not only the love among the mother and the child, the love among the siblings are also right. you know, destroyed by, by this woman coming into the prison. So you can see that, and 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 you can see that the, the the grievances they face when they are not able to take care of children, because they think they think their primary role is to give care for the children, and that's where in 2005 when I was heading the female prison, I actually implemented the Mother's Day in prison. Tell me, <laughs> okay, why I implemented? Because I feel that as a mother, I put a lot of care on my children's education and their well beings. So. And being a mother itself, seeing other mothers in the prison who are not support, who are unable to do such thing, I feel very sad for them. Mm. So what I thought was, um, shall I conduct a, a day where the the children can come into the because uh, you, you as you know visits in the prisons are through intercom, okay. not even physically. So they physically. cannot hug their they children. They cannot hug their children. So imagine if you are a, you're, if they face five year sentence, they are unable to touch the children for five years. Mm. So I was thinking, uh, let me organize this program and see how it comes. So initially, I just did it in the prisons. I did in the prison compound. I brought, actually, bringing in children to the prison is another no-no, you know, for the prison department. Really? But I try to break that 
uh, in uh, by by uh, telling my my superiors that I will handle the issues very well. I have all the security. You know, the security was one of the main reason they were quite skeptical about the whole program. But I ensured them. I said I will take care of this. So I did it in the prison compound. Uh, I did it in a small scale first, and it was very successful. You know, so, you imagine I also invited the media, and uh, the whole situation was like a. a how to say? Uh, it was, it was not a funeral place, but you know, everybody was practically crying. Oh. Not only the mother and the child, the prison officer who supposed who was supposed to be strong enough to handle the situation, including me. So everyone was touched. I and was emotional. unable to deliver oh. my speech. I had to stop halfway, and um, uh, the media people were also crying. <laughs> so I would have probably cried. So with that. No, th that's why they always say prison officers are very brutal. No, no, no. Actually, it's not. We have that hard too. It's just that sometimes we have to keep it detached so that it doesn't interrupt with our job. Mm. So the next year, I went up to my superior again and say, "Okay, I've done this. Let's. I want to do it outside in a bigger place." And there was another no-no from the security division. You know, bringing the pri bringing women prison outside oh. the prisons. But with all my um, confidence that I had, I managed to convince them. And they allow me to do, and that, the end there we brought in the, the the deputy minister, and he saw the whole program, and he was so amazed with the kind of uh, outcome that whole program gave. And he actually he uh, sent me a, a congratulatory letter saying that it was a wonderful program and that should carry on. And with that, I think from the year two thousand five till now, it was it is an annual program in all prisons, not only the female prisons, including they also do for Father's Day, and they also do for all festivals. With the contact visit. So, what what do you think that does for inmates and for their families? You see, when when you conduct this kind of program, you can see the the level of discipline among them because not everybody is entitled for this program. We right. choose, right? So, only the chosen one is given. So, based on their conduct, so you can man you can manage them very well. They listen to you very well. They they follow the rules and regulations. Very less disciplinary problem in the in the institutions because they know that if they they commit anything, right. they will not be given they that chance. They will lose their privilege. Yes. Right. I see. This is wonderful. I can you tell me a bit more about the um, women prison population? What is so how big is it compared to the male prison population? Who are they? And why are they? In, why have they been incarcerated? Okay. Uh, if you, as I mentioned earlier, the the female population is only about four percent out of seventy nine thousand, mm. and out of that, um, mm. uh, 70, 60 to seventy percent are foreigners. Foreigners because of no documentation, illegals, uh, uh, they have overstayed. You know, there's kind of immigration oh, issues. Oh, so they are incarcerated because of immigration. Immigration issues, issues not okay. because of any crime or what. Whereas uh, our locals, we can see that. Uh, Especially now, you can see there's a lot of issue on drugs, mm. but at the same time, they also have uh, they also committed crime because of their male partners. When I mention male partners, it can be either their spouses mm. or their boyfriends. Right. Uh, where uh, probably the, the the partner is all is in, in involved in some uh, offense, especially drug offense, and when they are together, they are also considered abetting to the offense. Oh. So wow. and uh, we, I also have cases where uh, women I inmates who are actually graduates. I wonder why they were there. And when I go up to their cases, I see that they were actually working in some financial section or financial uh, institution, whereby they miss they uh, misappropriate the the the, fi the, the money mm. to pay up their uh, male partner's debt or something like that with the alum. Wow. So they are there. That's why I say, did, have you ever thought about the consequence that you're going to face? Well, that love for is your blind. A actions <laughs> for love. Right? Yeah. When when you make all these observations, your experience for you know decades of work working, what has it taught you about how um, what gets women in trouble and how to avoid? women getting in trouble with the law and the criminal justice system. I mean, everybody needs love. I, I, I agree with that. Mm. But I think we have to, uh, a little bit, not to say selfish, to think about the consequences on what you do. 
that is why your decision making is very important you have to have certain level of education you don't have to be too too educated to have a proper uh, decision making skill but you have to have a proper decision making skill to see to think that with doing this by doing this what is going to happen to me not only to me on the people who are who I'm supposed to take care of if I'm a wife mm. I have got children I've got if I'm a mother I'm a, I've got children and what, what's going to happen to them if anything happened to me if I violate the law right and it's not only going to be uh, complete just by me undergoing the sentences it's the after that actually the worst prison it's not the four walls that they go through it is the the society that they come back that is the second prison that they actually face and is very very tough is it is it more different so i'm i'm fascinated to hear that the reasons why women are incarcerated are vastly different, different from why men are incarcerated that is why that is why if you see the male prisoners when you ask them what do you how do you think uh, the society looks at you they are not quite bothered about how the society thinks but unlike the female they are very worried the moment i uh, they are more worried when they are out compared to when they are in because they said that the moment we we go out the society uh, sees us totally in a different manner and it's not easy for us to penetrate that that thought so so dr kasala can i ask you having known this and um, you know all the research backs it how do um, rehabilitation programs cater to um, women and is it, are, are, so how are rehabilitations more gender responsive to the issues that women face uh, we ensure that um, for those who would like to further their education we provide education opportunities in the prisons uh, whether it's in the primary education or even the tertiary education we provide them so that uh, with that level of 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 uh, education they are able to make proper decision in life in future and and also to face the society because when they have something with them they have some value added to them while they in being in the prison they it will be uh, easier for them to manage the people outside rather than not having anything you know if they come in zero no education no skills no vocation training nothing with them if they're going to go out in that manner that's how the society is going to but i think with some level of education you know education actually uh, gives you the social mobility mm. it's easier for you to move around even if you had been an ex inmate but with some level of education you now people will see you at a see you in a different perspective actually. right yeah it's uh, i mean the social mobility you get to improve your life circumstances what other uh, support can is given to uh, these women you, you talked about how difficult it is to be separated from their family and the family unit is essentially disrupted what um, mental health support emotional support spiritual support do they receive and how does that translate when they finally get to leave prison okay we're talking about spiritual you, you if you if you have, uh, look at them majority of them actually have very base uh, no or very basic uh, knowledge on, on religion mm -hmm. let it be any religion in fact i think prison is the place where they actually uh, gain knowledge on religion mm -hmm. two aspects they they, they uh, the prisoners actually gain things in prison is uh, religious knowledge and also health care they would have not done their medical checkup at throughout their life outside uh -huh. but when they are in the prisons you have because the moment you you get admitted in the prison you have to do a medical checkup so and then of course you have the regular checks checkups and all that so all this will actually enhance their level of confidence actually you can also see them that their self-esteem is also very very low the moment they are stepping into the prison so all this uh, knowledge because we we cater for their attitude their skills and their knowledge right so with all this rehabilitation program whether it's going to be physical it's going to be vocational training or religious aspect will actually bring them to a different level and i think they are more confident uh, when they release but the irony is they are at times very well prepared to be released they say okay i will change okay. i will do this i will do that but when they move into the society without the support of the society especially their family members it's very important for women uh, offenders actually to have great support from the family and um, uh, we also ensure we also have this family counseling prior to their release to see how they can feed back into the family actually it's not it's not automatic when somebody 
gets right. released from the fa from the prisons and to just enter the family and say hi I'm back you know it's not so easy like that <laughs> it's to <laughs> they have to even the family has to be trained on how to receive back this uh, family members back into the society. Oh, and what do you train the families? We to do, do family counselling. Okay. When they when they come for visits, we do family counselling, and if we if we feel that inmates uh, uh, response to us saying that they need to to talk to the family, then we have these sessions with the family. Do we know anything about how um, the the rate of uh, recidivism amongst Female. Actually, it's less than one percent. Oh, so most Very much of them, most of them are first-time offenders. First-time offenders, and they never reoffend. Never reoffend unless they are drug offenders. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, so in having said all of this, what can, uh, what would you like to see in terms of um, change to in the community, in policies, in support for? Um, the women who are about to reintegrate into society? Thank you for the question, Melissa. <laughs> I am looking forward to for such question. First of all, if you ask me uh, personally, I think females should not be sent to the prisons. Uh -huh. There should be some amendment in the law where, not, not, not to segregate, I'm not segregating the male and the female, to say that offenders of such kind need not go through imprisonment. There are many other alternative sentencing where you can, you can actually uh, uh, implement the sentence and at the same time does not disrupt their daily life. Right. We have the, at, at, uh, currently we have the offenders compulsory uh, sentence where uh, you, they will actually uh, go on with the sentence and at the same time they can work and they can be with the family. So this will actually suit especially for the female offenders or the very minor offenders, those who don't have ICs, those who shoplift, you know, they don't have to, because when you go to a prison, your whole, your whole system, your whole uh, life actually yes. changes because of that one incident. You can be a one-time offender, but that actually disrupts your whole life. So uh, to me, uh, community sentencing for, especially if, since we are talking about female offenders, yeah. I think community-based uh, uh, sentencing should be more appropriate for female offenders because you, you, you realize that most of the time their crime is not a very serious crime, very minor crime, uh, or it's a, it might be a white collar crime. So for them, so that so that uh, the stigmatization doesn't, there's no issue on stigmatization or reoffending or relapsing. You know, all this all this re 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 thing mm. does not happen to them, and uh, you actually not only save that woman, you're actually saving the whole society. So. Uh, community based we are talking i think today's paper the star paper we're talking about uh, rehab compared for drug offenders mm, mm. i think uh, decriminalizing criminalizing this kind of offenders is also very important it is high time i think uh, a lot of talks a lot of agendas a lot of uh, debates has been going on but I, even after 32 years because i remember this this issue was discussed when i first intervened for this prison interview 32 years <laughs> ago talking yeah. about alternative sentencing but it, it's yet to be implemented. What do you think is um, stopping us from progressing? Because it is the more humane approach. If yes, you think because about I it. think we fail to understand that uh, actually imprisoning somebody is very expensive. Mm. You're talking about uh, taxpayers' money. Mm. You know, uh, whereas I think that amount of money can be used for more, more other, uh, uh, other, other prior, other, uh, other priority like uh, education and health, and. People think that when you give a community sentence, base sentence uh, to an uh, offender, you are going very lenient on them. Actually, it's not, isn't it? It's not talking about lenient, leniency or things like that. Uh, it is how you actually uh, bring them back to, first of all, you have to ensure that they repent. Not only by imprisonment, you can do it even, even at, the, at the community base, at the support that they get. Because for some reason, I think the public is also one of the reasons why they commit crime, right? Because it's a social problem. Right. So the society has to take responsibility on this and uh, I think you should uh, do away with thinking that community-based sentencing is a very lenient sentence. Okay, all right. I, I wish I could talk to you for another hour or so <laughs> to get all the insights that you've learned in your 30 years of service, 31 years of service. But I want to thank you for sharing a little bit of your knowledge and your experiences with us today. I appreciate your time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for taking, uh, bringing this topic to the public uh, where they can now think about 
uh, uh, they can have a different perspective on women offense. I hope so. Thank you Thank for you. your time. That's all we have for you on this episode of The Future is Female. I'm Melissa Idris signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.